just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? The Facebooking and the tweeting and the Instagramming, all that would not exist without our understanding of science. So it's amazing that you took that as an insult. You mean true for you is different from true for anybody else? Have yeah, to absolutely, to you. because I can't think either got to be true or not. I can't, no, no. Good evening, citizens of Netlandia, and welcome to O'Reilly Radio. Oh, geez, I was awfully loud there. Very sorry. Okay, <clears throat> let me try that again. Welcome to O'Reilly Radio number 135, recorded Friday, December 9th, 2016, where we dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go, oh, really? I'm your host, Andy Cowan, and I have my usual suspects. I've got Stephen Griffith, and I've got Daniel Atherton. Welcome back, gentlemen. All righty, so... Good to be uh, here. I don't have any, uh, n- nothing in the mailbag, no no real feedback, um, other than, geez, I'm really sorry that uh, I was so super ridiculously busy this week that I couldn't get the, the show from last Friday out until unfortunately Thursday. So that was, uh, that was definitely a problem. But uh, hey, you know what? I did get it out, and well, you get what you pay for, which is probably nothing. Unless, yeah. however, you'd like to contribute to the show, in which case I will, you know, there is a... Um, there's a tipping point where I start to care more, and you can help with that by going out to patreon.com slash Radio, and you can contribute to the show. So definitely, definitely work on that, please. Okay, <clears throat> but again, if you have any, uh, any comments, questions, concerns, uh, things that you need us to talk about or consider or stop doing or whatever, you know... We'll think about it, but you have to get that to us somehow. So how about you send us an email at oreallyradiopodcast at gmail.com, or we do have a voicemail number at 470-222-6759. All right, so um, gentlemen, we have uh, we have some, some interesting things to look at here. Trump's cabinet uh, has been filling out a bit. But yeah, not in the way that anybody really wanted or accepts or it's all kind of bad. Well, I guess the one the one good note was that uh, Giuliani decided that he was not going to take any position. Oh, uh, that that's news to me. Well, let's be honest. That was what about five it, five hours ago as as the as the world turns here. <laughs> yeah, they've said that. Like, oh, look, it's, you know, he's. Taking, taking himself out of it. Um, we're getting a lot of conflicting reports. You know, some people say, oh, this is done like months ago. Um, no, a lot of this is... I, I'm betting it's simply... Again, Julian is not necessarily one of his big backers. No, he didn't really contribute money. So I'm getting a feeling that there was a lot of back and forth politicking going on and just simply a, hey... Thank you for being there, Rudy. Uh, we love what you're doing for us, uh, GTFO. <laughs> well, no, well, there's it, always. It was actually Giuliani that said that said no. Hmm. It wasn't that he had, had not been included in the uh, the cakewalk that is the cabinet. You know, it's something else, which is just plain bizarre and weird. That already realized that he was just going to get raked over the coals once the appointments came along. Uh, before, because Democrats are already gearing up to call for roll call votes on specific appointments. Not all of them, but specific ones. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, out on the Hill, just a, a speaking thing, things that are breaking like today. Uh, okay. Donald Trump will name Goldman Sachs president Gary Cohn head of the National Economic Council, making him the second Goldman Sachs executive in Trump's cabinet. I, I just want to, uh, uh, to to all the listeners and everybody out there go try and find how many times Trump criticized Hillary for her ties to Goldman Sachs. Just just bring up that number for yourself. Yeah. And then compare it to him appointing people from Goldman Sachs to cabinet positions. Yeah, I I have uh, I take great issue with uh, the amount of hypocrisy going on with all that uh but it's not exactly surprising okay so oh. so dan you, you brought that you brought this article up what oh i brought so many yes you did um, you you really did the show 
I am here to help you present it. How about that? Okay. Um, <laughs> this. Oh God. No, we 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 we. There is an old, long-standing tradition of. Okay, you contributed to the campaign. Now that I'm in office, I will give you a a cushy appointment, but it's not usually to the cabinet. It's usually an ambassadorship to some place really nice or cool, like say to uh, a you're ambassador to France, so you get to go to Paris. Ambassador to England, you're you get to go to London. That's where you usually find presidents putting people who have contributed money to their campaign. Um, though. That trend started to change ever so slightly under H.W. Bush, mm-hmm. um, where he took one of his contributors and put them towards, um, I think it was he put it put his um, one of his big fundraisers the guy in charge of fundraising during his campaign into a commerce cabinet post. Okay. Um, but Trump is as usual, breaking all the rules in all the wrong ways. Um, he's just and, creating new ways to break the rules, new ways we, to break old rules. Yeah. We've got, uh, Linda McMahon who contributed 7.5 million to pro Trump super PACs, the RNC, and directly to his campaign, uh, as well as the McMahons have been large contributors to his charitable foundation for years. And for those of you that don't recognize the name McMahon, uh, that you know, if you flash back to say the early '90s with the World, uh, no, with the yeah, World Wrestling Federation. Yes, or the World, 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 World Wildlife Fund yes, sued the, them, and they changed it to World them. right. So and then, successfully, and they were forced to change it to World Wrestling Entertainment. Yeah, um, yeah. But yes, the, uh, it's those McMahon's. Um, uh, they're the ones that that uh, run the WWE. Uh, Linda, for a long time, uh, was. Uh, think COO for a while and then CEO and she has failed twice in senatorial campaigns in Connecticut um, and now she is going to be his uh, small business business administrator especially when you consider how WWE contributes to being a small business um, so that's just that that's the person who we, we've gotten the money that's the most. Look, they started with a small suitcase full of performance-enhancing drugs, and they just moved up from there. I mean, it was really just... <laughs> it was a real um, grassroots effort. I mean, we have the the the, the Devos family with Betsy Devos. Is it uh, Devos? I, I always pronounced it Devos. It might be Devos. It might be Devos. Right now, I don't feel like checking on pronunciation for this this family's name considering yeah. all the terrible things the family as a whole has done to humankind um so not the betsy, least of which is that that betsy doesn't have any experience in the job that she's been chosen for oh, oh well when it comes to public education absolutely no experience and let let's if you dig ever so slightly into her personal past um, yeah. and how she has <clears throat> helped to wreck public education in Michigan, her home state. Um, it, it's, it's a travesty that should stand the test of time, but she's going to be put in charge of education. Travesty I, that I should know, stand the test know, of time. That's, that's high praise. That's almost uh, poetic. No, it, I, I have teachers who are family friends and they are terrified of what this woman is going to do to education terrified um i'm not very keen on it myself no, nothing about it uh, sounds good at all to me going through the rogues gallery uh, we continue on to deputy commerce secretary todd ricketts who uh his parents contributed 1.3 million uh to trump's campaign 
Oh, the DeVos family contributed one point eight million. Just you know, yes. we seem to be going down in in uh, financial we're, we're, contributions. We're, yeah, yeah. Um, that's we're, that's we're the going... way this is ordered. From yeah. how much did you give Trump's campaign to you know what position you end up with? So the McMahon's yeah. gave seven point five million. DeVos one point eight million. Now we're in Ricketts one point three million. Carry on, yes. sir. <laughs> um. Uh. No, uh, there, he he is his family's tied up with uh, a, a number of financial organizations. Also, um, let's see here: TD Ameritrade, uh, Chicago Cubs, and he's going to be uh, deputy commerce secretary. Now, hmm. usually, it's the commerce department appointments that go to people who actually have contributed money. Um, and the, the deputy position is, is one that is how you hide them. So this, yeah. this is actually not as much of a surprise. Um, it's just, it, it counts towards the numbers in the other positions. Uh, now we, we get to, uh, another controversial figure, far more controversial than Mr. Ricketts. Uh, Stephen, I cannot pronounce your last name, uh, Munchen? Yeah, something like that. It's, uh, M-N-U-C-H-I-N, so. Uh, a former Goldman Sachs executive, uh, he personally contributed, uh, 425000 to Trump's campaign and is going to be Treasury Secretary. Yeah. You know, those Goldman Sachs people that were just awful and hillary was going to listen to every single thing they said yeah we're just going to take one of those guys that we demonized and we're going to put them in charge of the treasury right right but apparently it's okay since trump was never paid any speaking fees or anything for goldman sachs like <sighs> you know what hillary was raked over the coals for <clears throat> okay yeah uh, so on to, to labor secretary yeah, Andrew Puzder, um, who runs CKE Restaurants, the parent company of Hardee's, Carl's Jr., uh, who, uh, this, this, I can actually use the term deplorable. Um, oh, okay. th this, this man is an awful human being, if you can even call him human. Um, and he is so anti worker. That pretty much in any union list, he is like the number one offender. Gold, gold bullet. He's the bad guy. I mean, Saturday morning cartoon villainy. Uh, well, that he wants like fun. instead okay. of raising the minimum wage, he has promised within Hardee's to replace uh, everything with automation. That's his goal. Is instead of raising the minimum wage. Just replace them with computers and robots. Okay, so he is the very thing that we've been warned against. Yes, and he's going to be put in charge of labor. Okay. So Puzzler. when the robots come to annihilate humanity, we can all blame him. It, well, no, it, it's when you're you're seeing you know nations talk about. Going back to universal basic income, it's because automation is coming quickly. He, instead of trying to, you know, compromise on this automation, is pushing for it and just trying to phase out workers. He's trying to make people unemployed. He does not care. This man has no human empathy. So if you in fact call him human, you did call him deplorable. So I think that may fit. Yeah. No. The, the guy is is in my mind he is fight for 15's monster. If right. you want to put it into terms of, you know, humanity versus Godzilla, he's the Godzilla. Um but now we move on. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's carry on from there. Uh, we have Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, who contributed 200000 to Trump's campaign. Um, he was one of uh, Trump's first fundraisers. Um, 
and you know helped draw in all of that Republican money. Um, especially since the Koch brothers were, as they saw the white writing on the wall, were sitting out of this one. Um, yeah, they couldn't. They couldn't get their boy in because yeah. another billionaire decided to throw his own hat in. So, um, yeah. so Ross was the one who went around to you know Sheldon Adelson and a bunch of the others and got them to give and give generously. Yeah. Uh, so, and so though Ross himself only did, secretary. yeah. So yeah. he only contributed two hundred thousand of his own cash. He's definitely responsible for a hell of a lot more. Oh, so much more. Um, mm. No, th- this this guy went and made the phone calls, took the trips, sat down with people in their homes, and got them to sign the check. Yeah, according to his biggest supporters, casino magnate Sheldon Adelson and his wife Miriam, who gave a total of twenty-one point two million, and uh, that's just towards the campaign. That's not even—I mean, Adelson is reported to have signed checks to help with uh, RNC uh, shortfalls. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, interesting. Looks like he—he uh, he also coordinated getting the McMahons to donate their 7.5 million. Um, again, mm. no, th- th- Ross yeah. was the facilitator. Yeah. Um, uh, and in, instead of getting, you know, a small post that he gets the full commerce secretary job. He's not a deputy. He's, he's the guy on top. Um, and again, commerce is where you typically put your fundraiser. Uh, it's just, you don't necessarily make them the secretary. You usually make them the deputy. But yeah, here we go. Well, you know, he, he might actually have the chops to do the job. I he may might. not. I may not like how he does it, but he may have the chops to do it with uh, with what he's done for this. But no, uh, the, as the, as Mama Van in the in the chat room has said, uh, yes, this is cronyism at its finest. Oh yeah, down we, the line. you know when we were talking <clears throat> last week uh, a. About you know Sarah Paling having this this moment of lucidity, uh, and calling the carrier deal crony capitalism, we're just seeing more and more and more of it coming from the president elect, yeah. and I don't see it stopping anytime soon. Now this looks like um, quite literally business as usual. Right, so that was um, that was that part. Oh Yay. yeah. So how about uh, how about we talk about something fun, like the Middle East? Let's talk about the Middle East. Oh yeah. Um. No, this th- this is as as we've been saying I, earlier, the world is getting ready for Trump, and all, every nation is getting ready for him to come into office and how to deal with him. Um. The Saudis are getting ahead of things. Um, already a Saudi Arabian journalist and commentator, uh, Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, he has been banned from writing in newspapers, making TV appearances, and attending conver- uh, conferences uh, after um, criticizing Mr. Trump's Middle East policies at a think tank on November 10th. Now, most of these things aren't hugely public. You have to be somebody in that sphere to read that news. But they're already getting ahead of it and cutting the head off the snake right now. Well, sending a clear message. Yeah, when when we talk about cutting heads off and Saudi Arabia and and uh, and what they I may do, have chosen the wrong words. I don't know. You um, might have chosen the right words. That's the thing. So I, but we're not talking literally about beheading the fourth estate here. No, yet. but we're, in we're, in literal terms, like heads no. are not rolling, but. No. Metaphorical heads are rolling at this point. Yeah, th- this is That's a, 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 it's an important a, a, distinction in Saudi Arabia. This is a clear statement to any journalist within Saudi control that you will not criticize Trump. 
considering Trump's knee-jerk reactions to things. This is them protecting themselves. This is them sending a clear message that we're open for business with the American president. Uh, and we will not do anything to risk that. Even if we're calling, our, our, our journalists are calling him out on things that are true. Um, you can't report that. You're not allowed to because that puts our relationship with him in jeopardy. It doesn't matter how small time you are. All it takes yeah. is him hearing an errant tweet about it, and it will affect foreign policy. Because the guy has such thin skin. And yeah. this is how one government is dealing with it, let alone other more authoritarian regimes throughout the world. There's, wow, there's just so much here. So much to unpack. That it's also just the whole, yeah. you know, uh, us who have been intelligent, who've been following stuff, everything else, and warning people about essentially, hi, this is the coming apocalypse. You know, the people holding the signs, the end is nigh, and we're actually watching it happen. And we're seeing some people pay attention. And we're seeing others, like like that constant meme of the dog sitting in the house, going, it's burning, going, this is fine. We're watching that. Yeah. And we're just kind of going. Guys, the yeah. hell! <laughs> I think well, I, I think I'm going to name so much. I'm going to rename this segment. <clears throat> you know, the top of the show here, our dystopian present. Yeah, um, that's not entirely wrong. No, um, no. This, but uh, part of the reason why I put grabbed this one was actually. Again, I wanted to get your opinion, Steve, on this, since you have more of the foreign policy background of of our current panel. And just going, is this just Saudi Arabia overreacting, or is this something we should be expecting to see, not just from Saudi Arabia, but, you know, um, say, like, places like Turkey, which has a, a more, while democratically elective, a more authoritarian style uh, president. I, uh, I, I wave my hand a little bit about Turkey's being democratically elected, and I've known people in Turkey who will sort of agree with me on that. Um, in regimes where you have any form of true... I, I think it's a combination of issues that you're running into here. You're seeing, yeah, somewhat authoritarian regimes, which already have a restriction on free press, because there are certain things in Saudi Arabia, press you are not allowed to cover, you're not really allowed to say. <clears throat> and on top of that, you're getting ones that look like they have a vested business interest or a potential high amount of business interest with Donald Trump coming in and they can see what they can get off of what's going to come from that, all the business he's going to throw their way. Because, you know, essentially he's all right with let's keep foreigners from coming here, but let's send money everywhere else. Okay. And they want <clears throat> some of that dollar. So I'm I'm just really letting things click here. And it hurts sometimes, don't it? Well, no, it I don't know. I don't know if yeah, 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 it hurts. Okay. So <laughs> there we go. W- <laughs> one of our taglines for the show has been follow the money. Yeah. Yeah. This entire presidency is follow the money. Yeah. Because it's a business arrangement for him. Everything, yeah. Every yeah, so decision he makes you, yeah. is business. But again, we a lot of you out there wanted a businessman as president, a businessman as president. Congratulations, America. You finally have a businessman as president. By the way, he's a horrific businessman and doesn't actually know what the hell he's doing. Well, but he's a businessman. I don't want to say he doesn't know <clears throat> anything about what he's doing. He's fine for he his just goes, business. It, 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 he is all about business for self-interest. He, yeah. he is not somebody who wishes to, to build a company, let alone a nation that benefits everybody top to bottom or even top to mid. 
well, again, and no. help. You about? Not even top. It's just him. Yeah. I think that he would ask here? how many eagles are involved in eg- egalitarianism. <laughs> you know, how many eagles does that take? Do I have to get three? Is is three enough? You know, that kind of thing. He, he doesn't but understand that kind of concept uh, where it's it, equal it, for everyone. Um, it's not only that, but this actually, and the idea of following the money actually goes back to the whole thing we touched on a bit last week or the week before about his calls and talking to the president of Taiwan and the president of the Philippines, yeah. Huerte. Uh, again, people, think about how much stuff in the U.S., fine electronics and everything else, is manufactured in Taiwan. You know, mm-hmm. how much stuff we actually get out of there. Oh, look, follow the money. There's business involved there. Oh, yeah. People who aren't really in the tech business don't understand just how many jobs have been outsourced to the Philippines. <laughs> Not to mention very yeah. low cost manufacturing of pick your shoe company. You know, yeah, I, I, I have business. to laugh. You know, I'm 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 in the tech trade. Uh I'm just in a in a rarefied element of being also in, in healthcare, but with uh, with IT jobs, the there was the the notion that's been pounded into our head for about two decades that you had to go to college and get a degree so that you didn't have to be blue collar; you could then be white collar, because the blue collar jobs were going to go away to automation. Well, yes, they have gone away to automation, and they're not coming back. They did not really get outsourced overseas. They just went away. Mm-hmm. In the same way that they were afraid of, of those jobs going away and that you had to then move into the tech sector. You had to become, you know, white collar and move to the, the ivory tower, uh, you know, businesses. Those jobs are actually being outsourced. Those are the jobs that are being transplanted because they're digital. It doesn't matter where mm-hmm. the job is actually performed as long as the job is being done. So yeah, that's what's really been I've... outsourced. So, oh, yay, I have a degree. What can you do with the degree? Well, you could move to the Philippines and get a call or center job. Get a call center job here and then train your replacement as I did twice. Yeah. So um, it's, okay, it's, it's really whole, funny. Rural it's... America doesn't know what corporate America is doing and they're both mm-hmm. blaming each other. It's but we're also looking at ridiculous. in this case, we're looking at someone who really doesn't understand like international policy, international politics, diplomacy, the the uh, very sometimes razor thin margins of we're friends versus we have a shooting war of you know in international politics. We have a a guest. My daughter has arrived. Hello. Hi, Evie. Hi. Hi. She's not feeling very well. Guys. Clearly, that was about three octaves low. Yeah, she's she's not feeling so hot. So uh, let's move along from there. And uh, hey, go ahead and uh, talk about the Pentagon for a minute while I take care of the little one. All right, good, so and good luck with that. Here we go in finding other terrible, terrible, terrible things. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, with this one, folks, it's long. By all means, dig into it. It's not just the Washington Post who's covering this. It's just the Post is one of the ones that frame it well. Um. But the Pentagon went and did a budgetary study. Um, And now they're trying to bury it. Uh, Because what found was that they have overspent $125 billion. Billion dollars. Not million. Billion dollars. Um, And they're burying it because they don't want Congress to slash the defense budget, even though we have now a president-elect who wants to spend more on defense. Even more. Um, this is a perfect example of wastefulness. Yeah. The, the, the thing that, that Trump says he's going to cut out 
which I'm fairly certain he won't. Um, the report, which was issued back in 2015, January 2015, uh, identified a clear path for the Defense Department to save $125 billion over five years. The plan would not have to require layoffs of civil servants or reductions in military personnel. Instead, it streamlined the bureaucracy uh, through attrition, early retirements, cur- curtailed contractors, which is one of the biggest parts of defense spending, and make better use of infotech. Um, the study was produced last year by the Defense Business Board a federal advisory panel of corporate executives, consultants from McKinsey Company, um, and based on reams of personnel and cost data, their report revealed for the first time that the Pentagon was spending almost a quarter of its $508 billion budget on overhead and core business operations, uh, such as accounting, human resources, logistics, and property management. Now, a lot of this was from them supporting 1,014,000 contractors, civilians, and uniform personnel to fill back office jobs far from the front lines. Um, that workforce supports 1.3 million troops on active duty, the fewest we've had on active duty since 1940. Um, so we're looking at Almost one individual for every single serviceman doing some form of business or info technology job to support our military. We have to look at this and think, I remember, because I remember growing up in the 80s and hearing about some of the 90s, you know, you didn't have contractors. Contractors didn't exist. It was all government, military, all kept in-house. But then along came the idea of contractors being this amazing way to outsource save money. and save money. And time and time and time again, we have seen showing, no, they cost at least as much, if not more. Yeah, no. Again, when you get a lucrative government contract, part of it is you try and put in a little bid. So you keep getting contracts. However... Depending on the length of contract, the other thing holds true, where is you bid low, but when you finally send them the bill, it's high, and the bill, they have to pay it. It's a, 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 a agreement, a business binding legal agreement between our government and that business. Those contractors the- are going to get paid. Also, to put things in perspective, because, you know, people out there think, you know, I know our listeners do sometimes, the the $125 billion is a staggering number that's really hard to wrap your brain around. Uh, several groups have come together and figured out that in order to end global hunger, not just in one country, globally would cost $30 billion a year. So not even all of this overhead amount yeah we could end global hunger um also theorized with bernie's campaign was to cut and streamline some of this defense spending Mm -hmm. to pay for every single u.s citizen not just those from the ages of 18 to 24 Every single U.S. citizen to go to public university for four years. You you can do that. You and I have heard this argument before about the, you know, oh, my God, you know, we're cutting, like, especially when it came to Obama in the military, it was always, oh, look, they're cutting down the numbers. My God, he's completely gutting the military. They're going to have no power whatsoever. It's the smallest it's been since pick a time. And yeah. most times they bring up, you know, they show, oh, look how powerful we were at World War II. Look how many troops we had. Well, yeah, that's true. We have a lot less troops then. But as I remember, it was the Obama-McCain election when their vice presidents went at it. And it was the 
McCain's vice president was going, oh, look, we have the smallest budget, smallest military ever, so little spending on the military now. Look how weak our country's gotten. And Biden came back with, yeah, but we also don't spend money on horses anymore and do bayonet-mounted cavalry charges. You know, time goes on. That was the best Technology occurs. Ever. It makes things better. Uh, we've got a missile that can kill 300 people. We don't need 300 troops to do it. No. Uh, and with going by the current administration, it hasn't changed over yet. Um, the usage of drones. Yeah. That has massively increased. Uh, that's putting less boots on the ground. Um, and while we're, we're breaking a lot of eggs and we're not winning a lot of hearts and minds with the drone program, it is, well, it should be saving money. Um, but again, what this, this, this budgetary data showing is that as a lot on the left have said for decades, we're spending too much on the military and the military, especially leaders at the Pentagon just want more money because Again, it's for themselves, it's for their constituency. Um, and it's for the people who, you know, grease their palms. A lot of contractors spend a lot of money trying to grease up the people who decide on those government contracts. Um, I would love to see a study on how many, you know, military lobbyists there are. That would be great to see. Um, but no, there's there's all of this wasteful spending. Um, and they're burying it. And huh. again, like going further down in t the 2011 Budget Control Act, the Pentagon was forced to stomach a hundred and thirteen billion dollars in AMAC cuts over four years unless Congress and Trump can agree on a long-term spending deal by October of this coming year. Oh, and to answer your question, thanks to my wonderful speedy Google foo, according to OpenSecrets.org, because all lobbyists actually have to be registered, this is something most people don't realize, the total number of lobbyists for 2016 for defense, 717. Total spent by them or for them, 92.8 million. That's smaller than yeah. I thought it would be. That's significantly smaller than I thought it would be. Still, that's, that's, that's staggering numbers to, to any individual. Um, yeah, I was probably expecting a little bit more, but that's still a lot of grease palms. The report itself that this is referencing is definitely informative. Oh yeah, it's 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 in line. You can you can dig through this. Just this section here, the bottom line. Just the very you know before they even get into the colorful charts and everything. <clears throat> um, bottom line. Now this is from. These are the final briefing slides. This is the little fine print down here. Uh, as approved by the Defense Business Board in its public meeting held on January 22nd, 2015. The full DBB report will contain more detailed text, which will reflect the totality of the points discussed and any modifications adopted by the board during their deliberations. Uh, we are spending a lot more money than we thought. <laughs> Bullet point number one. We can see a clear path to saving... 125 billion in the next five years. Greatest contribution contributors to the savings are early retirement and reducing services from contractors. Yeah. Oh, look. I mean, you yeah. could really quickly, quickly pass that infrastructure bill that Bernie was talking about, um, or you could bring some of those jobs that we're contracting out for within the military back into the public sector, back into the military, and save money. You know... And still employ people. Possibly employing 
yeah. more people or putting more money towards the GI Bill, which we I think we can all agree is a good thing. I, I just want to remind people that, you know, at, at our personal level, we're usually dealing with saving, you know, $5 a month. Because if we save $5 a month, you know, that ends up being, you know, uh, 110 bucks a year. You know? Maybe. Okay. So, as the compounding effect. Now, in this, they're saying every billion saved in 2016 is worth 5 billion fiscal year 2016 through 2020 due to the compounding effect. You know, so the same same deal but with an awful lot more zeros. I just want to remind people what a billion dollars is. Yeah. Uh put put it this way. Um you look at for our 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 Florida viewers and listeners. Uh a old style Florida institution like the Breakers. High, high end hotel here in Florida. That's not a billion dollar operation. It isn't. And yet that is a a ritzy, ritzy operation. That's not even a billion dollars. Okay. You go <sighs> to places like uh, going my background's in the arts. Uh, Tampa Bay Performing Arts Center. Uh, that's only in the millions. Okay? Yeah. And, and that is a massive amount of property. As well as paying personnel because they put on productions locally as well as being a roadhouse. No. Th- that's not a billion dollar operation. The the money here is astronomical. Yeah, there's um, I'm there was a series of images with money on pallets, you know, that indicated uh, you know how much how much money just in physical stacks that was. Uh, ah, here we are. Here we are. Let me pull that up right now because it is super relevant. So this is out on global research. What does $1 trillion look like, physically look like? So, uh, you know, one... Okay, let's talk about stimulus packages and bailouts. A billion dollars, a hundred billion dollars, eight hundred billion dollars, one trillion dollars. What does that look like? So we'll start with a $100 bill, currently the largest U.S. denomination in general circulation. A packet of $100 bills is less than a half inch thick and contains... $10,000 $10,000 fits in your pocket easily and is more than enough for a week or two of uh, shamefully decadent fun, as they say. Uh, believe it or not, this next little pile, you can see it right here, little guy, you know, yeah. standing with it, uh, is $1 million, 100 packets of $10,000. You could stuff that into a grocery bag and walk around with it. While a measly one million looked like a little little unimpressive, one hundred million dollars is a little more respectable. That's and it fits neatly on a standard pallet. One billion dollars, and now we're getting somewhere. That's ten pallets of one hundred dollar bills. Okay? Now, you want the trillion dollar? Want the trillion dollars? Let's go. That. That's the guy in the corner. (laughs) Oh, good heavens. Oh, by the way, the pallets are double stacked. Yeah. Adding zeros, moving decimal points, is big. It's a really big deal. So... We're talking about a billion dollars. That is 10 pallets of $100 bills. I just wanted to put things in perspective. Sometimes we need to do that on 
on the show. Um, but yeah, that's that's the physical scope of what we're looking at. That amount of liquid cash, I I guess it exists. I don't know what's in circulation. I don't really care to even do the Google Foo on that one. But it's a lot of money that we're talking about just casually shaving off of what the military industrial complex is in this country. And just it casually. Would be savings savings for the taxpayer. You know how how uh Ryan keeps saying yeah, Paul Ryan. that that social security it is is bankrupting us. That it's a horrible, horrible expense. Just think about putting that a hundred and twenty-five billion dollars that could be saved. A hundred and twenty-five of those ten sets of pallets. 1,250 pallets towards Social Security. Yeah. Towards anything. I mean, the government likes to throw money at problems to make them go away. The military-industrial complex likes to throw money at bullets and make enemies go away. That's kind of what we do. But, you know, there are... um, Okay, so... Let's see, one pallet, that's one million dollars. Yeah. One pallet. Um, We have munition rounds that cost more than that. Well, no, a million's not the pallet. That's a hundred million. That's a lot of bullets. Oh, is that, okay, that's a hundred million. Yeah, okay, yes. Yeah. That's a hundred million. Thank no, you. The Thank million you. is unimpressive. Yeah, there's the, million there's the million. The grocery bag. Grocery bag of, of, of dough, yeah. So a hundred million dollars every pallet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Also, to answer your question earlier, yeah, for a few for a few minutes ago, yeah. According to the FederalReserve.gov, there is approximately one point four eight trillion in circulation as of October twentieth, twenty sixteen. So go down to that 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 <laughs> more than that. that. Yeah. More than that, folks. Almost that plus another half. Is what That's is an a active lot. circulation. <clears throat> That's a lot of cash. One it's one pallet. Well, what those those pallet. are those are double stacked. Yeah. Yeah. What's well, the hundred million? Just give me one I don't pallet. Even, I'm good. I don't even need the pallet. I would just like a grocery bag. Thank you. Well, no, I want uh, the pallet because at that point, I'm set for life and I'm good. I'm still fine with working. Just, just give me the grocery bag. I can um, want at that point, but with a pallet, I could afford my own island. You don't need a pallet. Micronation, um, the radio, radio micronation. We can make this happen. Uh, but no, this this is insane amounts of spending. Now, part of the reason why I put put this up there, why we're discussing this, that's is because fifty pallets of, wide. By the way. 50 wide. What is it? It's 50, 50. wide. <laughs> um, At least as deep. <laughs> no, the part of the reason I want to bring this up is we see Trump and what he's saying currently is with his, his infrastructure plan, with almost every single plan he's coming up with, is a move towards further and further privatization. So 125 billion in overspending. We're going to be overspending a lot more on defense if we keep contracting more and more services out. Because at the end of the day, they know that as long as they got that contract, forever long they got that contract for, the government's on the hook. By the way, that is 10,000 pallets. 100 rows. Yeah, that's... Yeah, 50 times 100 rows. 
uh, that at pagetutor.com slash trillion slash calculations dot html it gives the complete breakdown of what this is with dimensions and how it all stacks up nice and neat should you ever need to uh stack the amount of money that's currently in circulation in the united states yeah you know should you ever need to do that yeah again so we spend more on our military we'll put that in the show then <laughs> then multiple nations combined combined also remember as big as that is you see all those pallets you see that wonderful graphic of how it is the gdp of the united states is around 17 of those yeah and that so that's the gross yeah that's the gross domestic product and also to keep in mind, uh, for all of our listeners, because I know a lot of you are Bernie supporters, that wealth right there that you're seeing, all those fragging pallets, that's what the 1% has. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, That's the money that a handful of families get while the rest of us are scraping by. These are the kind of people that Trump's putting in his cabinet. Now, didn't Trump say at one point that he had a, a value of like $10 billion? That's one of his many claims, but I think it, I think he brought it down to five. Yet he still doesn't want to reveal his taxes no, for multiple no. reasons. Well, well, one of those reasons is his lawyers for tax purposes are arguing against the value of that he claims is in his properties. Well, if he had five billion, then he would have fifty pallets of hundred dollar bills. So there you go. He's got the fifty. <laughs> oh, and that's if he's just uh, just at five billion. But uh, you know his his net worth has vacillated from being. I think it was at a high point. Of being like eleven or twelve billion, down to as small as three billion, just over the uh, course of the of no, the speculative race. The the speculative race, the lowest point I believe was one point two one. One point two one. Wow, that is yeah. low. Okay. Well, okay, so that's fun. What uh, what was the the end all takeaway of? While I was while I was away, just to, the, you know. while 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 you're away, um, the biggest takeaway is that um, currently how our military is set up is they're spending way too much money on contractors because privatization increases cost; it doesn't decrease cost. Yeah. Okay. So it uh, it mostly confirmed what we've been speculating about for a long time. And Trump pushes further and further, as well as most of the Republican Party, pushes for further and further privatization of all services. Yeah. Including defense. It's a good time to be a defense contractor, I, I imagine. Oh, no, dude. Good time. To if be. if I I was I was involved in any gun designs or you know <laughs> yeah. tanks, be good be heavens, stuff. tanks because ta tanks would appeal to Trump. Yeah, they're yeah. they're big, they're brash, they're bold. We need those. Unless you actually so, ask the military, and then they say they don't need them, but we keep buying them anyway because of the military yeah. industrial complex. Good luck. Trump likes tanks. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say that right now. I ha I have no no facts towards this, but Trump likes tanks. He does Actually, like tanks. No. I would say that he does like tanks. Yeah. I do have one little source because I know who's replacing him on The Apprentice. Who, whilst present, he's still going to be executive producer. I actually heard that he was going to try and be on. No, 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 no. NBC has told them that he can't. Um, oh, good. Someone so, actually has a brain. <laughs> so he, he's agreed he's going to be too busy. Um, 
so he's just going to stay on as executive producer, which means he's going to be fielding phone calls no, on no one a monthly basis. No one will bother calling him. Um, no, they're yep. going to be forced to call him. Um, no, the his replacement is Schwarzenegger. Wait, get a minute passed. But 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 Arnold doesn't like Trump. No, he doesn't. But you know what? He'll take his money. That's true, because that Austrian is definitely a capitalist. He's Unabashed. very Amer- he's very American. <laughs> Soon as he came over and got his citizenship, yeah. he registered Republican. Yeah. That's that's true. He has not unlike Trump, he has not changed his his political loyalties. He has always been a Republican, always will be a Republican. Uh, the one thing that we have in common between our views on this show and the gov- the former governor is his stance on climate change, which is it's literally killing people. We need to fix this now. I I actually I find that I agree with a staggering large number of things that uh, that the governor was, you know, is is still in favor of. Yeah, um, like hi. Uh, 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 yeah. Reasonable tax rate on the wealthy all of a sudden supports our economy. Also, having a high minimum wage is healthy. Yeah. Something that I, that most Republicans can't get through their skulls, yet he understands. Yeah. Well, also being the uh, being governor of the sixth largest economy in the world. California. Yeah. And he um, works with a Democratic House and Senate for in California to to get pill, bills passed, yeah, to get policies passed. As as much as I disagree with him on a number of issues, he's his political track record is he is willing to work across the aisle in the spirit of how our democracy is supposed to work. Yeah, I I find that uh, though. His ideals may not have changed. The ideals of his party seem to be leaving him. So, at some point, you can still be yourself. You can still believe all the things you believed. But if you look back at that Republican Party platform, how much of that do you still buy into? You know, I mean, you really gotta... If you just keep voting that party line... Yeah. And that part and they keep moving the goalpost where you're going to end up outside the field somewhere. Yeah. It's like Again, funny. The, it, I was right there in the stands and now I'm in the parking lot. What happened? As they tore not, down the it's, stadium. It's, <laughs> but it's not just on the right side. No, no, of the yeah, aisle. You're, you're It's also on the left correct. side of the aisle. I'm talking the left side I- ideology of the aisle is no longer left. It's 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 to the right Centrist. of center. Yeah. No, it's even to the right of center. It's yeah. not even center anymore. For the most of it, yeah. yeah, it's been so far dragged to the right. I I actually would uh I would say that though I do have very many liberal leanings, I really find myself as a centrist. I'm not extreme on anything. I, I I will I will have. I just to want people to be cool to each other, liberal. really. But Dan, but are you really? That's the you thing. You aren't in comparison to me. I okay. always show up on all those tests as being very far to the left. I have been referred to multiple times in tests, quizzes, and certain professors at UCF as a communist. Nice. Okay. Well, I there you go, folks. Problem, I can argue the fact that I'm not. <laughs> Oh, yeah, well, we can certainly do that, you know, because we're intelligent that way and know a few things. But, okay, so <clears throat> Trump likes tanks, but he doesn't yeah. seem to like Boeing. No. Oh, that shit. Also, he doesn't like reality or facts. No. No, he does not. Uh, <laughs> okay, so he uh, he gaffed and said... Uh, well, the plane is totally out of control. It's going to be over $4 billion, Trump said in response to a question about his tweet. I think it's ridiculous. No. Um, the thing is, I, I, I've somewhat followed this story. 
it mm-hmm. goes deeper. Oh, it goes way deeper. Yeah. As they um, replied. Well, he, 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 he lied through his teeth, but part of the reason for the lie is he doesn't want to use Air Force One. He wants to use his own plane. Yeah. Because it's more homey. So essentially, what he wants to do is have the United States government and the people of the United States pay to refurb, replenish, and do all the things to his plane that would have to be done to Air Force One to make it Trump, Trump Force One. And then, of course, when he's out of office, it's still his plane. Yeah. That's essentially what he's wanting to do. Yeah. And that's why he got the, the $5 billion number. Because to do that to his plane would cost a fraction of that. But, of course, Air Force One go, will last for 20, 30 years and go through multiple presidents. Yeah, and be already has public yeah. pro- property. Well, there is, are, I think, two yeah. 747s are two that are outfitted two. as Air yeah. Force One currently. No, and already he is he is pushing for the usage of his own plane, and the military is being forced to, as a form of indulgence, come up with a plan to be able to use his plane. Well, the thing yeah. is... Which is costing us money. In order to do that, uh, let's, th- let's think about it, okay? Let's dissect this, uh, this issue a little bit. Because there are going to be people out there, like my parents, that are going to say, well, why can't he? He's got the plane. Wouldn't it be cheaper? No. Because in order to maintain the safety of the president, not one plane is flown. Two. Or three are flown the, the every time. Would, the plan would be tentatively Decoys. that if he's using his plane, one, it's going to have to be refurbed. Yeah. Two, they will be flying four planes instead of the two or three. And people because don't really they can't understand. refurb his enough. Again, people don't understand what it takes to make Air Force One Air Force mm-hmm. One. You know, yeah, you've got all the plush office stuff. I think there's how it's made, actually, on that. But but beyond that, yeah, there might be. But it's also, people don't understand. Well, there's stuff they couldn't cover in that. Oh, yeah, of course. People don't understand just how much electronic warfare systems there are, which are highly classified. Yeah. And, you know, public's not really allowed to know their capabilities are in Air Force One and Air Force Two. Like the chaff cannons and stuff like that. Chaff, flares, and straight up. You are completely you know, digitized. High, high end. Yeah, there mm-hmm. is there is a how stuff works on uh, on Air Force One. Um, and of course it's a it's super clickbaity. But I will go ahead and add this to the show notes for people to uh, to dive through and figure out you know how does Air Force One work? <clears throat> Should you be interested? Again, and and as for for Boeing's contract, which is not to refurb the current planes, but to make two brand new ones. Which, let's be honest, it's time it's about time to retire the ones they've got. Again, they're reaching their standard operational life cycle. Also, the electronic suites. I mean, you could just re- refurb those, but we've got entirely new technologies, entirely new worries now, electronically. Plus, we've uh, got much more efficient engines and much more efficient systems. Uh, new actual uh, aircraft-grade materials that can be used, should be used. Today, on a- uh, accor- this was back in, let's see, where, where, when was this? This is 2013, I think. So today, there are actually two planes that regularly fly under the designation of Air Force One, nearly identical Boeing 747-200B jets. The planes themselves are designated VC-25A with tail numbers 28,000 and 29,000. The two planes have the same general structure as a normal Boeing 747-200B with and similar capabilities. They are almost as tall as six-story buildings, and they are as long as a city block. Each has four General Electric CF-6 Dash 80 C2 B1 jet engines, which provide 56,700 pounds of thrust each. 
top speed is between 630 and 700 miles per hour, and the maximum ceiling is 45,100 feet. Each plane carries 53,611 gallons of fuel and weighs 833,000 pounds, fully loaded for long-range mission with a fuel tank. The plane can fly halfway around the world. So, yeah, that's just standard for a 747. Uh, and then they go ahead and, and do all the stuff. Add in all the plush stuff, plus the electronic suites. I mean, he has to be able to communicate to anywhere in the world on that plane. Air Force One has 4,000 square feet of interior floor space. Floor space. Much of it looks like a hotel or executive office than a jetliner, except for the seatbelts on all the chairs. The lowest level of the plane mostly serves as cargo space. Most of the passenger room is in the middle level. The upper level is largely dedicated to communications equipment. The president has onboard living quarters with his own bedroom, bathroom, workout room, and office space. Most of the furniture on the plane was handcrafted by master carpenters. Also, Air Force One is actually secured against nuclear EMP strike. It is hardened to be able to... Oh, look, you can't imp the thing out of the air. And that yeah. takes a lot. Oh, there was, a, there was a, a, a footnote here. The Hollywood version. Air Force One got its Hollywood close-up in 1997's Harrison Ford movie Air Force One, which is probably all Donald Trump knows about Air Force One. So... Yeah. While some of the details in the set are inspired by the real thing, the movie takes major artistic liberties. Air, the Air Force says the real plane does not have an escape pod, as depicted in the movie, or even onboard parachutes. Of course, an escape pod could be one of the many special features that the Air Force won't talk about. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, that's amusing. But yeah, so he just doesn't know what he doesn't know. Yes, but he and most of his cabinet are people who like disinformation. This is how they live. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is how we live. So we have uh, <laughs> we have uh, reached the end of what I'm willing to uh, to exert on this particular episode. So ooh, we got a little inception there. Whoa! And then I lose you. Of course, that's how this works. There we go. Except I still lost you. No, there you're back. Okay. I just lost... You have returned! Uh, I just lost uh, certain other things, like this. The ending credits. Okay, so, if you've enjoyed what we do here and would like to help us out, there are four ways. You can donate to the show through patreon.com slash radio and get early access to show content when I have the time to actually put it out. Uh, you can also please review us on iTunes, which helps us uh, gain more audience. You could tell us, tell someone else about the show. That would really be helpful. Share us out on that social media thing. Uh, and of course, how about you engage with us directly? Send us an, a message on social media or the electronic messaging machines at Podcast at gmail.com. Or you could leave us a voicemail if you're talkative to 470-222-6759. That's always ready to take your call or text. Thank you for choosing to waste your valuable time on us. This has been O'Reilly Radio, part of the Random Axe Company. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 United States license, with exception of the music created by Comptech.com, who holds the copyright thereto. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and we will see you again real soon. <laughs>